This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 327, recorded on March 6th, 2015. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon De Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. The sun is streaming in here, isn't it? It is a crystal day outside. There's no cloud. Yesterday it was. Uh, There's a little bit of cloud out there, but yesterday not too it was much. snowing like crazy. It was. Today the uh, winter is over. It is now. Is that uh, what it is? <laughs> well, it's not over, but it's still it, pretty cold out there. Minus three Celsius. Yeah. It's going down to minus twelve. Oi. But no more snow in the forecast. We've had three snowstorms that's this week, nice. and that's it. Yep. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Howdy. How are you, How doing? you guys doing? We're fine. We're just well up here. I think you got almost better weather than I do. Really? Let me see here. Oh, I'm just. I got to do the conversion here. You know the. Uh, uh, we're talking 52 Fahrenheit, yeah. 11 Celsius, huh. and gray. Gray. With uh, not quite drizzle, sort of, you know. Heavy you guys had fogs. a lot of rain there last week, didn't you? Yeah, a little bit, you know, not too bad. I mean, you got let flooding me, in some of your cities. Let me tell you what it's like here, Rich. So <laughs> I take the subway a lot because I teach downtown, right? Oh, it was bad yesterday. It's cold. You go oh, down the bad. subway. It was bad. The water is dripping down the steps. It was They're bad. black and slick. You go in the subway, it's dark and the lights are hardly anything. That's right. There's water dripping everywhere. Everybody's got these coats on. They're looking at the ground. <laughs> it is like being a mouse in your cave. Yes. Yeah, it sounds apocalyptic. It sounds like what it's oh, like to be a coal man. miner. <laughs> it's a mess. Everything is a mess. Yeah, and the subs, were, they weren't working yesterday very well either. It took me two hours to get from 21st Street. That's crazy. Oh. Two hours. Crazy. Oh, what a bummer. I left at four at 21st Street and got here at 6. Yeah. And then I had to get my car and schlep another hour and a half at 35 miles an hour because Arc. they didn't plow the roads. Also joining us today from <laughs> northeastern Michigan, I forgot, Kathy Spindler. Southeastern Michigan. Southeast Damn it, Michigan. I didn't write it on the show notes and I forgot. I had it in here permanently. It's, nothing is permanent, Dr. Khan. Did you That's know right. that? Oh, you're Careful. a good Buddhist, you are. Yeah. <laughs> I learned from you. Okay. Also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. You can type and talk at the same time. Yes, huh? I'm just typing Southeastern Michigan in all caps. <laughs> right underneath, red letters. <laughs> right underneath turn on the recorder. So. Right. Do you have nice remember, weather out there, Caleb Kathy? We do. It's uh, 19, sunny, which bad. is also minus 7 uh, Celsius. And while I was gone in California, they had this weird phenomenon of on top of the snow, it rained for a while, and then it froze. Right. And so everything right. is uh, like this slick frosting look still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's glazed over. I've right. never seen it like that. And it's lasted several days. Kathy, you you know, you've never seen crusted snow? No, this is, I've seen crusted snow. I grew up, you know, in Ohio. And <laughs> right. I've lived here 13 years. But I've never seen it like yeah. this, yeah. where it's, it's, it's just amazing. It's probably... Uh, close to three eighths inch centimeter thick, right? And uh, yeah, it's you know like I shoveled some stuff up on it and I wasn't Listen really thinking, and it slid right back down at me. <laughs> Sound like a yeah. bunch of farmers. <laughs> yeah, we get we get that. Um, the test is whether you can walk on it. Yeah, right. this you right. break through. Yeah, that's. Um, <laughs> I, I've yeah. only seen it once where it was where it was thick enough that you could actually stand. I, I was a kid at the time, so that probably helped a lot. Too. <laughs> so last week I was in uh, Western Michigan, also in New Buffalo, mm -hmm. and they the group that New I was Buffalo. visiting New Does Buffalo. Well, at least enough? they warned you about the weather the with the Buffalo. town name. <laughs> This was where Green Spirit Farms is, and I was visiting and doing a book signing, which was nice. And uh, they five people showed put up, me at a right? resort of all things. And uh, said that we wouldn't pick me up until the temperature went above uh, zero degrees. And, of course, at 9 o'clock in the morning, bingo, it was one degree. And I said, must be the heat bubble. <laughs> You're just a riot, Dixon. Yeah, they didn't laugh either. Did we talk about the Breakthrough Prize here on TWIV? 
I don't breakthrough know. prize? You'll tell us, though, won't you? You guys don't know That's about this? That's when the snow isn't strong enough to support you. Yeah, exactly. when, Kath, when Kathy said breakthrough or, or Alan, I thought of the breakthrough prize. Tell us what that is. Well, this is a prize um, established by Sergey Brin and Woyiki, which is his partner and founder of 23andMe, Jack Ma, Kathy Zhang, hmm. et cetera. Mark Zuckerberg, you might know that name. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, right. And they give you three million bucks for doing cool stuff. Really? So this year, the winners included Victor Ambrose, Jennifer Doudna, and Emmanuel Charpentier, yes. the last two for Getting CRISPR, Gary Rovkin. Three million dollars each. Nice. Mm -hmm. And then you get to stand on stage with famous people like Kate Beckinsale, Benedict Cumberbatch, Cameron Diaz. Ah. Wow. Mark Zuckerberg. He didn't show up this year for the, for the yeah. uh, awardings. Uh, well, you know, the coolest thing about this, it <laughs> seems to me, is that it makes scientists into rock stars. I like that idea. Well, we already are. <laughs> yeah, but nobody knows it. And nobody, you got to show up with a celebrity, okay? Well, we don't have three. I would rather be a Twiv host than have three million dollars. <laughs> well, also, uh, how about a Twiv I, host no, a with minute. three million dollars? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're you're a real negotiable. Bo you're a Buddhist. You want the three million, huh? <laughs> well, we'll we'll promise to you know, recycle I'll give it. a million to Twiv. And take two for my. <laughs> We're going to recycle the whole thing. Don't worry. You better <laughs> talk to your wife first. I don't know if she's not going to want to give it to Twiv. Well, well, now when Charpentier and Dowdna get the Nobel Prize, it's almost going to be a letdown. Hey. Yeah, well, it's much less money, right? Like, they're going to have to split the prize, <laughs> exactly. and it's going to be less, exactly. and uh, exactly. probably Cameron Diaz won't make it there. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I thought that I would mention It's pretty neat that uh, they get that kind of wrecking. Well, why doesn't Zuckerberg show up? He's a busy guy. Oh, come on. He's got people He, he was going to go, but he got distracted checking his Facebook. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, anyway, it's cool that Ambrose and, and Rovkin got it because they're not going to get a Nobel Prize. It's already been given out for small RNAs, right? So they got $3 million. I'm sure Victor. So Victor Ambrose was a graduate student with David Baltimore, and then he did a postdoc at MIT across the street. And he, I taught his wife how to sequence, okay? And he, used to, he made this little company, and they built gel boxes, and he would sell them for 60 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> to support himself. Now he doesn't have to do that anymore. <laughs> nice. Or he can charge more. <laughs> he could charge more. Anyway, that's the breakthrough prize. We oh. ha we have some follow huh. up. What Dixon? No, no, no. I just went. Huh. Uh, Alan, can you take that first follow up, please? Yes. Uh, Suzanne writes. Your conversation reminds me that I've heard people say they can smell some cancers. I think this is the uh, cancer smelling dogs conversation. <laughs> right. Um, usually lung cancer, and usually on someone's breath. My husband was diagnosed with colon cancer several years ago, and his breath had begun smelling weird to me in the months before. He's been an ardent vegetable hater, but I would tease him that his breath smelled like Brussels sprouts. Soon after he started chemo, he smelled like himself again and has ever since. He's cancer-free so far since surgery and treatment. Of course, that's not scientific at all, but it was interesting to me. Ironically, uh, uh, now that Brussels sprouts are getting popular, he's begun to like them. But I haven't noticed any Brussels sprouts breath yet. Thank you for the shows. I'll second the person who said your Ebola information was helpful. I did a lot of spreading that information around to worried friends, too. I feel like it calmed a few fears. At least it made me useful. Keep up the good work. <laughs> I guess he doesn't like asparagus, huh? Probably not. Hmm. What's the matter, Dixon? Don't you know what asparagus does when you eat it? Of course I do. I'm, I'm in a bad mood with you today, Dixon. You better not talk to me. Because? <laughs> You're in a bad mood. What did I do this time? <laughs> Everything. Nothing. It's fine. Well, if you don't want to hear what he's going to say to you, Dixon, you could just take off your headset. That's You know he's what? Right That's next true. To me, that is absolutely Kathy, right. can you take the next one? Sure. Kevin writes... Hi again, Twivers. I just wanted to write in to clarify the reason for conjugating protein therapeutics, such as the soluble CD4 you discussed last week, to the FC portion of an IgG antibody. You guys speculated that the reason might be to get killing of cells bound by the conjugate, or phagocytosis. Though these may be marginal effects, the principal reason is actually to increase the half-life of the drug in serum. Most proteins in serum are rapidly and nonspecifically engulfed by macrophages and other phagocytes. However, proteins like IgG and albumin that are meant to persist in the blood are bound by FCRN in endosomes and then delivered back out into serum rather than being degraded. For example, see this paper, and he sends a link. When drugs like monoclonal antibodies need to be infused, 
you can't rely on daily administration to maintain the proper dosage, so a long half-life is key. I wonder if this will be as important with protein drugs that are expressed, parentheses, produced from <laughs> AAV vectors. Here, presumably, the therapeutic is being continually produced, but I... Alan, move your cursor, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I suspect, hey, it doesn't say, Alan, move your cursor. I can see this. But I suspect that having lower expression levels with a long half-life will still be ideal. Cheers, Kevin. Autoimmunity. No need to read this part on the air. P.S. No need to read this part on the air, but for the future, I wanted to clarify. Audioimmunity is pronounced like autoimmunity, just switching the I and the O. In the past, when you've read the name, and thank you for doing so, you've read audio immunity. Pretty sure that all of our listeners are coming from your shout outs, and the numbers go up every time you mention it. <laughs> so some people are clearly finding it, but we've had a couple of comments that people had trouble because they were looking for audio immunity. But okay. if we call it auto immunity, they might end up listening to Self Magazine. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's a u d i o m m u n i t y. So we're we're saying audio immunity. Yeah, and but we shouldn't because we're putting an audio extra immunity. I in. Audio I'm immunity. Audio immunity. Audio immunity. You know what, auto Kevin? Immunity. Kevin, you should not make a hard <laughs> name for your podcast. <laughs> it's true. All right. That's the number one rule. Good. Yell at him, not me. That's, that's, I like that better. <clears throat> I'll get to uh, you. So, wait a minute. This is good to know about the FC portion of the antibody. Yes. Yeah, 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 right? yeah. I'm happy for that. Explains and another I reason. I also think that this is a classic example of uh, biological and evolutionary bureaucracy at its best. Okay? <laughs> so, yes. cells learn how to clear proteins out of serum, you know by making receptors and gobbling them up and stuff. And then they decide, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. We can't throw this one away. Right. So they make a yeah. new receptor that That's recycles good. it. That's, That's good, yeah. Right. Rather than, rather than just recognizing that it wasn't supposed to be eaten in the first right. place, they spit That's it back <laughs> out. Yeah. Yes. Right. Dude. I, I think I actually, I, I feel like I was supposed to know this at some point and then forgot it. But yeah, mm. this is this is useful information that that stabilizes the, the protein. That's why to add it. Uh, the the uh, body of information that I was supposed to know and forgot is uh, getting really big. <laughs> <Bigger>. Yes. <laughs> so last week when we talked about this paper, uh, Alan brought up the fact that we had worked with soluble receptors many years ago, yes. which I had totally forgot about. <laughs> so I went back to the, mm. one of those papers, which was published. 25 years ago, all yes. right, and it was about selecting poliovirus mutants which are resistant to neutralization with soluble receptor. SRR mutants. And I just, I just wrote a blog post because I, I wanted to revisit it. And one of the quotes from the paper, it has been proposed that soluble cell receptors might be effective antiviral therapeutics. It has been suggested that mutants resistant to the antiviral effects of soluble receptors would not arise because mutations that abrogate binding would be lethal. So we kind of rubbed this in the nose. And at the time this paper was published, clinical trials of soluble CD4, the precursor to the version we talked about, were underway. And so we said in the last paragraph of our paper, our findings temper the use of, of soluble receptors as antiviral compounds. <laughs> Yep. It was fun to revisit that again. <laughs> it's called a hedge fund. I'd, I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> I, I, we love poking fun at the or criticizing the HIV folks because they got all the attention, you know. And here and the we, money. And the money. Yes. And we should polio. You know, you can learn oh, from yeah, polio. Yeah. Um, Rich Condit, can you take the next one? Paul writes. Re the AAV expressed E C D four I G the paper we did last week. E Twivocators. <laughs> Thanks for the excellent nice. discussion of this exciting article. Your discussion added a much deeper understanding to what I was able to gather from the popular press and the abstract figures and tables available online. For windless rainy degrees see in Philadelphia as I, uh, as Philadelphia awaits another winter storm warning. Well, so that's nice. I'm glad we were able to present that in a digestible fashion. Yeah. Hmm. Dixon, can you read a letter? I'll do my best. Jeff writes, Hello, Twiv team. I thought the recent discussion of vaccinating premature infants by Johnny was too pertinent to pass up commenting on. 
I started listening to TWIV many months ago because of the birth of my daughter, who was born at 28 weeks gestation age. Her hospital stay was a many-month ordeal, and one of the big milestones was my daughter getting her first round of childhood vaccines. Because of her weakened state, the immune challenges from vaccines were scary, and she had an inc increased rates of apnea and bradycardia. I was also frequently warned about the impact of RSV on infants. Perhaps you could do an episode on RSV one day. All this caused me to seek out info on viruses and vaccines, so I found TWIV. She's now nine months old and doing quite well. Her six-month-old vaccinations happened without incident. I can now turn my focus to more normal parenting activities, figuring out how to encourage my daughter to be an enthusiast to, about science as I am when she gets older. It is 60 degrees Fahrenheit out here at the beach in San Francisco where the fog is never too far away. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the TWIV team for many hours of great content. Jeff. Tell, Isn't tell that her, nice? Tell her to listen to TWIV. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Just play it while she's Lullaby around. Lullaby her to sleep Get with her a TWIV episode. That's right. Well, I'm, I'm glad you found TWIV when you were looking for your information. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Right. Before we get on to our main paper, I thought our listeners uh, would enjoy a little revisit to a topic we talked about, um, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. And this is the finding of a, of a chlorella virus in the respiratory tracts of people and the suggestion that um, this might lead to um, cognitive impairment. Mm. Remember that right. paper, everyone? Yep. yep. So there were two letters published in PNAS, one of them. Um, so, I, so I guess we all remembered the paper, so we're not infected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. If this is true, I don't know, right? Right. So there's a group from Denmark. What paper? <clears throat> Yeah, I know. <laughs> What's a paper? <laughs> All right, anyone else? Kathy, you're not, you're not going to participate, I know. I am not. You're, you're, I'm trying to find out what TWIV episode it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, this group from Denmark wrote a letter called Traces of ATCV1 <clears throat> and Canthocystis turfacia chlorella virus 1 associated with laboratory component contamination. And they say... Um, the reported presence of the <coughs> algae virus in that pre previous paper was based on just a few sequence reads homologous to the virus, and the reads spanned relatively few bases. And they did their own experiment involving 289 human specimens, and they found the virus in 16 samples of seven different tissue types and also mm. a non-template control. They think... It is uh, laboratory contamination, and they found in their lab that two components, um, an RNase free DNAs and a RNase RNAZ mini elute cleanup kit, um, seem to have contamination with this virus or viral sequences. Mm -hmm. Now, what I don't remember is whether we raised we discussed much about the the contamination possibility on that paper. I think we mentioned it, but they seem to have controlled. Um, right. There was a control missing. I think there was a water control. And, and actually, over on PubMed, you know, you can make comments now on PubMed. Someone said, why didn't you do a water control? Right. And they had a little back and forth with the authors who were understandably testy about this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, we shouldn't get testy. We should just be serious. But we are people in the end, right? Yes. Anyway, so... Um, they said to confirm the findings, the, the authors perform quantitative PCR, but this is subject to the same kind of contamination. So they end up saying, you guys need to be more careful. And so then the authors responded with a letter, of course, saying, um, we don't have a problem. Uh, it, our findings are not explained by contamination. And they give four reasons. And they say first, which is kind of funny they say first we didn't just find it by sequencing we also found it by pcr <laughs> they say, we did controls we did it in different laboratories and we don't find contamination of the reagents that you did hmm. and the second thing is that there's an association with cognitive testing results but that seems to me i don't think that's the right way to say the, the results. it's a little circular it's circular yes. right and they say, we infected mice, and they made antibodies, and they got dumb. So it must be right. <laughs> Who knows? That could be totally, as, as one co uh, listener wrote on the website, that could be bollocks. People had very impressive correlative evidence for XMRV. Indeed. They sure did. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, so basically, they say we're are, we're sticking by our results, and we hope that other people will go out there and validate it. So there you go. Time right. will tell. Time will tell. Yes. It was Twiv three fifteen, and I'm looking now at the PubMed's Commons comments, and it was the person asked, "May I ask why you didn't sequence the negative controls?" Mm. So it yes. wasn't just a water control, but they wanted it to have sequence been sequenced. It as well. hmm. yeah, yeah, that would have been good. All right, so we have a paper today which I came across, <clears throat> just published this week in PNAS, uh, and this is uh, by a, a large number of authors in many different places. Big collaboration. Huge collaboration. France, South America, uh, Brazil, Germany, um, University of Pennsylvania, um, and the first, Gab- who else am I missing? Rwanda, Gabon. Gabon. Uh, Cameroon. Rwanda. Um and it involves lots of gorillas, so a lot of people here involved in it. And one of the authors, well, the lead The gorillas author, are not credited, though. That's too bad. <laughs> are, are, are they in the acknowledgments? In the title. Mm, no. Mirella Dark is the they lead author. They did dump author. some data into the paper. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and and uh, Martine Peters <laughs> is the last author. And Paul Sharp and Beatrice Hahn, who are well known oh, yes. for the similar work on the origin of uh, uh, HIV and, and from chimps, are on this paper as well. And I have to just point out here that um, I'm really proud that I had I had Beatrice Hahn's daughter in my virology class. Plus, she was my TA the next year, and this year she's in medical school here. Oh, that's I, excellent! I saw her. In one of, I just think it's so cool, you know. Nobody. Mm-hmm. She's very she's very shy. She doesn't tell people this, mm-hmm. but uh, I, I think she she was great in class. Anyway, this paper is called "Origin of the HIV One Group O." epidemic in western lowland gorillas now everyone knows hiv oh you know i thought this is two hiv papers in a row mm-hmm. yes i'm so sorry in a That's way good. i mean i just this poked this jumped out at me and so but i don't usually like to do two of the same virus uh, but this row. but i uh, but this was cool this is cool and Thank this you know? is very different from the previous one. It is different. Yeah. But I, and I, I love, I really love this. You know, I wound up messing around with a bunch of maps and looking up <laughs> stuff about the animals <laughs> and all this. I love this stuff. Yeah, this is multidisciplinary. Yeah, this is this is wildlife biology and uh, all sorts of ecology stuff and And the methods evolution. are cool. So. Yeah. Go ahead. I- And I was just about to say, um, for those who don't spend a lot of time in the zoo and just think of these as big apes, if you want to think about the key thing about gorillas, among all the primates, they're the largest. And chimpanzees, they're the most intelligent other than humans. They have the second largest brain size. Mm. Um, So just to remind everyone, HIV um, has so far infected 78 million people. Wow. And 39 million have died. Wow. And at the moment, 35 million people are living with it. Mm. Maybe a little more. It's amazing statistics. This all started from zoonotic infections, as you will see. We know right. HIV-1, the main virus that's out there, originated in chimps. So there are, there are four groups of HIV-1, each of which represents a separate crossover of a simian virus into people. And then there's HIV-2, which is yet another. Yeah, HIV-2 we'll talk about another time. Right. But it comes from a, um, a different kind of a monkey. Right. Group M is the main uh, source of all the infections, 99% of all the HIV infections. Uh, and then the other groups, O, N, and P, are much fewer. Group O is less than 1%, and it's mainly limited to Cameroon and Gabon and neighboring countries. Group N, there have only been about 13 cases. So this came from an animal into a human, and it is only, as far as we know, there are 13 people out there. Maybe there are more. That's all we've detected, but not many. And Group P, only two cases, in, in Cam- both in Cameroon, Group N and Group P. So this is, this is a simian virus that jumped into humans four different times, and nice. only one of those times turned into a global pandemic, the, yeah. and, and one yeah. turned into a significant uh, as we'll see, local epidemic, um, and then two others were kind of probably dead ends for the virus. And M's, the M jump from chimps, which this is what um, Beatrice Hahn and, and Sharp and their colleagues, and Martine Peters was involved in that as well. That's what they showed by sampling many, many different 
uh, chimpanzees uh, a number of years ago, and they found that, in fact, Group M came from a very specific uh, group of chimps in Cameroon, and about probably about 1920 this happened. Sure. And so it was incubating, and as Africa was colonized, this contributed to the spread and so forth. And then, of course, by the 60s and probably the 50s, it was spreading globally. So and that was a that was a geographically isolated group of chimpanzees that even carry that virus. Yeah, so these chimps don't move around much. You know, if there's a river in, in between them and someone else, they don't go across it. They don't like to, to swim. So um, <clears throat> there are not... There are only a couple of uh, different kinds of chimps, which are pan troglodytes. You know, we have pan troglodytes schweinfurthy. Then we have pan troglodytes troglodytes, and a couple of other. I think there are two others, and then only two have uh, this particular SIV. And the S, that SIV, by the way, that went into chimps came from lesser monkeys. Um, because they they're like over forty different species of those, and they all have their own SIV simian immunodeficiency virus. So what what the chimps acquired, and they they acquired this a long time ago, way before humans did. They got an infection from uh, what is thought to be mona and red cap mona monkeys and red capped mangabees. And what chimps actually have is a recombinant of those two viruses, probably by eating them. Yeah, fighting or eating. Yeah. yeah. Is, so, is the bonobo listed among the uh, sampled they, primates? They sampled them previously. They do not carry SIV. Okay. okay, just curious. Yes, the bonobos were sampled. Okie doke. And they keep to themselves, you know. And they're not vicious. Right. Well, they have sex, so that could transmit a virus, right? <laughs> yeah, but they don't hunt down, you know. But someone might hunt them, you know, and, and injure them and spread. But the fact is oh, that, right. that, that they don't. It doesn't happen. Right. Well, it hasn't happened to spread this virus. I shouldn't yeah, say I, it doesn't I happen. I'm still amazed that gorillas could be the source of the virus since they well, don't we'll eat Well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that later, Dixon. <clears throat> right I now we're going to do the, 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 the really important <laughs> thing about these you're things yell at me early, is, are you? <laughs> the really important th- uh, thing about these is, is not just the spillover itself. But the amplification, that's what yes. that, that yeah. book, The Origin of AIDS, is that what yeah. it was called? Yes, exactly. Uh, really, really describes so well. And yeah. I think the deal with M in particular was that it got a foothold in uh, Brazzaville and Kinshasa. Right. Uh, where there was a lot of uh, human activity going on mm-hmm. uh, of a type that really provided an opportunity uh, for this to amplify. And that, mm-hmm. that has as much to do uh, with launching this thing as anything else. Right. Right. So there had been some suspicion um, that the P group came from gorillas, but the O maybe, but they didn't have good data. So they went back, and in this paper, they've looked at more samples. Um, and um, this they do non-invasively. They actually collect feces, mm-hmm. uh, and they confirm that it's gorilla <coughs> by typing the DNA. But, you know, it's not easy to sample blood from a gorilla or a no. chimpanzee. So this actually turned out to be a, a big finding years ago that you could find virus yep. sequences and antibody as well in feces. So it makes it a lot easier. So they go to the places where the gorillas hang out and they just collect feces. You know, when when um, uh, when um, <laughs> Beatrice Hahn was here, she gave a seminar about this. And she says she had... She has an army of shit seekers in Africa. <laughs> That's what she said in her seminar in front of everyone. I guess in German it would be scheiß something, right? Yeah. Right. You know what the word for seeker is in German? Suche. No. Uh, no. Kazook? It's no. to look for, I think. Yeah, sucher, maybe. <laughs> anyway, so they collect the VCs so they don't have to worry about it. I think this is great. I want to ask Well, it's, it's certainly easier than collecting blood, but you're still talking about tramping around in... Um, you know, malaria-filled jungles and searching for piles of dung and figuring out whether it's gorilla. And a, the gaboon viper is an endemic species there, too, and those are very dangerous snakes. Yeah, so Su- we, we appreciate the dangers involved here, for sure. Sukhanda. Sukhanda. S-U-C-H-E-N-D-E. That's searcher. In German. Zukunda. Okay. And, then a, and a viewfinder they, is a zucher. They or probably a finder is build a, it into one word, too. Yeah. Well, we have German listeners. Please let us know how you say shit seeker. 
I would really like to know. Um, all right, so then they collected additional fecal samples. Southern Cameroon, 1,696. That's a lot of fecal samples. <laughs> Scheisse. Yeah, Scheisse. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Gabon, 915. And these would be uh, Western gorillas, right? Yes, they're in the West. Then they had Eastern lowland gorillas, which are in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, 103 oh. of these. Yep. Two different communities of mountain gorillas in DRC and Uganda, 218. Oh. So like the chimpanzees, the gorillas are geographically somewhat isolated. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, oh, so this is a good word here. I wanted to get to explain before this. They say molecular epidemiological studies of SIV in chimps have shown that these viruses exhibit phylogeographic clustering. <laughs> Wonderful, largely due to rivers and barriers that limit the migration of wild chimps. So they keep to themselves, and their viruses keep to them also. Right. Phylogeographic. Isn't that great? Yep. Mm -hmm. And they're not sympatric, right? Look at that. The different chimps are not sympatric. St. Right. Patrick's Day is coming up, by the way, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> it is, Dixon. Are you going to celebrate? Absolutely. All right, so I have a lot of samples here. And then the first thing they do is this wonderful assay. You know, I first looked at this figure, and I said, there's no way that their bands are so nice. And I realized it wasn't a gel. <laughs> it's not a gel, no. <laughs> you know, I, I thought it was a regular old Western blot, and, and it's not. So they have these these commercially available strips. It's called right. an Inolea assay, and you can go to the website of the company. Yep. These are, it's not easy. It's and they're, it's what? called a line immunoassay, but it's not easy to get the information from their website. I tried no. two different times. I had to join the site. Oh, I finally sent them email, and, and then when I went in the show notes, you had found... A better page than I had, but I, I would. It, there wasn't, you know. And I went back through their previous papers to see if I could get any more about it. But no, and I, the website doesn't have any references to the, you know, primary thing, and ugh, mm. it was very frustrating. Commercial stuff, yeah. So if you work for this company, please, um, right, consider. Basically, these are nylon strips, and they've placed recombinant proteins or, or peptides corresponding to all the different HIV-1 and 2 proteins. They're hmm. separated. So, hmm. And then you, you bathe them in an extract of the gorilla feces, which has antibodies in it. And if antibodies to these proteins are present, you can then detect them with kind of an ELISA-based format where you have a colorimetric uh, um, assay. And so on these strips, they have IgG as like a positive control. At three different levels. The top one is 3+, plus, the second one is 2+, yeah. plus, and the next one is plus minus. <clears throat> And then you can see, you know, the various, the glycoprotein, GP120, GP41, and so forth of of the two viruses. You can you can easily pick out samples that are positive. So for clinical use, I think one of the selling points of these strips is that they are very good at distinguishing between HIV-1 and HIV-2. Yeah. For the purposes of this study, the uh, simian immunodeficiency viruses cross-react with HIV-1. They do. Uh, and so, as a matter of fact, are there a couple... There are a couple of minor hits, or at least one, with an HIV-2 protein. This mm -hmm. one over here on the far right looks like he's lighting up GP-105 from HIV-2. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. But, uh, but they can be used for SIV, which is handy, and apparently they're very sensitive. And they have low background because they use these recombinant proteins or peptides sure. to put on the strips. So they're very standardized and these beautiful rectangular shaped bands. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I just said, wow, what a blot these guys can do. <laughs> so 2,932 fecal samples, 70 reacted with at least one HIV-1 uh, antigen. And these these samples mm. all came from four sites in southern Cameroon. Which, by the way, mm -hmm. is the same general locale that uh, 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 HIV-1 M subtype came from, hmm. right? Uh, from the chimps, yeah, right. Same, same, same general area, right? The chimps, I think, were in southeastern Cameroon, and most of the positive samples here are in southwestern Cameroon. Right. But it's sure. it's a yeah, given given the distribution of gorillas and chimps. This is a very specific narrowing. So they did mitochondrial DNA sequencing to confirm that these were from western gorillas. So I guess you do that after you find your positives, right? So you make sure that you don't want to do them on all of them, I suppose. Right. And then um, you can tell if they're from one or multiple individuals, right? 
by looking at that. Right, and they uh, they talked about doing uh, for some of them when they could microsatellite sequencing. Mm -hmm. So that must be from uh, chromosomal DNA. Is that right? I suppose so. To distinguish individuals, you wouldn't do that from mitochondria. Mitochondria would not, right? Microsatellite, right? Sixteen different individuals in this uh, seventy antibody positive pool with that minus some samples that were degraded. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then across these four sites in Cameroon, there was a lot of variation in how many um, positive samples there were. So they have one site called BP. Uh, 48 out of 161 samples were antibody positive, and this corresponded to 10 people. So, you know, of course, when you collect... Ten, ten gorillas. Ten, gorillas. Yeah, <laughs> gorillas are people. Close enough. <laughs> Close enough. Hey, you know, they call them individuals. That's right. Well, they are. Yeah. Yes. They, they are, are individuals. They are. Um, so this is... When you collect feces from the forest floor, of course, you, it could be from one person making a lot of feces or multiple, so you don't know or, until or, you... Or gorillas, too. Or gorillas. Uh, yes. Am I making gorillas into people? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. I like gorillas a lot. Do you ever see a gorilla in the zoo? It's very sad. Oh, oh yeah. Yes, they look indeed. at you and like, oh, I have to tell you that, um, uh, no, I'm not going to do that diverge. Never mind. Anyway, so at one place. No, we don't allow digression on We Earth. had 10 <laughs> individuals. And then at site BQ, they only had 2%, uh, 9 of 435 antibody positives. They were from one person. Uh, one gorilla. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> one gorilla. Gorillas are people, my friend. That's right. Ferrets are not people, but gorillas are people. Well, ferrets are not humans, we say. Not That's right, about right. people. That's right. uh, screening of uh, over 1,100 Western lowland gorillas, they have a prevalence of about 1.6%. So that's how many are antibody positive, yep. cross-reacting with uh, HIV. BP site, now this BP site, which had a lot of 10 different individuals, they had two social groups. Um, one of 12 and one of 17 people. And within these two social people, groups... not people. All right, I'm not going to not do this anymore. I'm sorry. I'm just, for some reason, you I want to... Correct me call. enough. I'm allowed to chip in here and everything. It's okay. I'm not saying... But I can't fix it. Um, all right. Just substitute gorilla whenever I say people for the rest of the show. For the rest of the show. <laughs> Okay, you, people, you all understand that? That's so anyway, right. the, the point here is that within, within these two social groups, I mean, with all these words that are hum- social groups, right, individuals, yeah, I'm yeah, thinking absolutely. of people, uh, 40% were infected. Yeah. So, you know, in these social groups, these people are interacting, and that probably helps spread the virus. And the other social groups are not positive, and they're right. not, obviously. Yep. It's kind of interesting. Yep. Um, then then they, they tested these antibodies actually both positive and negative for viral nucleic acids using uh, PCR. So I, I just want to pause here for yeah, a minute because yeah. I, I this the whole thing blows my mind. We're talking about dung here. Yeah, poop. And out of the poop, we get antibodies, viral sequence, yeah. mitochondrial DNA, <laughs> chromosomal DNA, so we can tell that it's a gorilla, we can tell what species it is, what individual it is, yeah. whether or not they've been exposed to this virus, and what virus type. They really it's dump incredible. a lot of information. Yeah. They dump a lot of information? Is that what you said? Yes. <laughs> dump a lot of information. And I, rem- I recall earlier in these studies when, you know, in these types of studies, when they were, you know, trying to get, uh, well, they capture urine but they'd also try to get somehow get samples from the animals and stuff. But they figured out how to do all of this stuff from dung, which really yeah, makes it that great. that was the key. That was the key for right. sure. Right. And in particular, being able to to do the, the mitochondrial DNA and the chromosomal DNA so you can make sure you got the right animal and you can uh, segregate out of the yeah. individuals. It's incredible. So the PCR was... Positive, they've detected viral RNA in 33 of 57 antibody positive samples. So, you know, the others probably, uh, I guess it's degraded or. Well, they, uh, oh, yes, right, okay. And then they also found it in 15 of 200 antibody negative samples. So maybe that's too early an in infection. Right, right. That's, what, that's what really there. interested me. The notion that some of these animals, uh, I mean, that's got to be you know, within weeks of infection, right? Or a week, yeah. I mean, really early. Yeah, yeah. They found, found virus, no antibody. Yeah. Right. 
I think they should. I think they should have noted whether the feces was fresh or older. You know, that would have really helped. Now that's interesting. Yeah. You know, in the jungle, it steams, right? Yeah, but it tends they, to they, turn over be, pretty they've fast. Gotta be, yeah, they've got to be recovering this stuff pretty quickly. Because That's otherwise right. it dries up or something. Otherwise, it's going to dry, it's it's gonna just, dry up. It's going to get decomposed. Are you kidding? It's, the people, detritivores will have their way with it. People eat it, right? Well, yeah. not people, but other, other, other I'm, things. I'm bowing out now. <laughs> yeah, right, my the, bet is that they just go each morning and collect it. Yeah. Because right. right. they say they collect it ar- around night nests and feeding sites. Exactly. They also pu- they also say they have opportunistic collection. Do you know what that means? Yeah, um, just as they're walking to their site, if they see some, they, they collect it. it. <laughs> if you step in, <laughs> exactly. <you> <laughs> that's how, Alan, that was why Once I thought you exactly. Step in it, you probably ruined it. <laughs> What's that stuff on the bottom of my boot? So oh my here, god! It's a- <laughs> here in New York, we could tell how many different dog colonies <laughs> right, there are, what right. kinds of dogs, right? Whether, they or whether they're right. dogs or wolves. <laughs> I don't know if you got parvovirus in there. <laughs> Now, RNA copy numbers from a few to more than a thousand per milliliter. That's a lot. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, now they they sequence um, this uh, nucleic acid. Uh, they amplify sequences. They do this in two stages. They amplify little bits from the various parts of the genome: the GAG, the structural region, the polymerase region, and then GP forty one. And they compare them later on. They're going to do whole genome sequences. Um, but they find that all of these new, uh, they call this SIV gore, SIV gorilla, all the sequences are more closely related to each other and to previously characterized SIV gores than to SIV CPZ, which, means, which they say means that you have a single chimp to gorilla transmission, which resulted in SIV gore hmm. infecting gorillas. Which is surprising because chimps and gorillas are sympatric. Yeah. Right. But we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that later. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting. You'd expect more. You'd expect more spillover events between yeah. these two. Yeah, yeah, I I had the hardest time going from looking at the tree to that statement indicating a single chimpanzee to gorilla transmission. Yeah, at I, the origin I, of the SIV well, gore lineage. Well, because if you had multiple transmissions, you would have multiple lineages originating from the chimp virus, right? So you'd have virus one, two, three, and each of those would give rise to a right. separate little clade of gorilla viruses. But that's not what you see. You see them all clustering. Uh, yeah. So they originated from a single introduction. I think well, you'd even see mean. some SIV gorillas in the branches where the SIV chimpanzees are. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly All right. right. I'll buy that then. Okay. Um, Full length genome sequencing. So wait a minute. Yes, sir. So they they are their own thing, <laughs> uh, but uh, the vast majority group with uh, HIV one type P, and there's one little sniff of one of these viruses, uh, BQID two, where the gag. Uh, sequence groups with HIV one O. Okay, yes. mm-hmm. so in this first round of uh, phylogenetics, they just get the barest sniff right. of grouping of one of these guys with O, as mm-hmm. if, and this is important because we're trying to we're trying to get a grip on where HIV one P and HIV one O came from. Yep. All right. Yep. All right, they do some whole genome sequencing. So they get three, they did this on three samples, and they sequenced the entire viral genome, 9,000 some odd bases. And they can see that they are typical um, SIV, HIV slash HIV looking genomes with all the right proteins. And from this, so this is very interesting, contrast to what they found with the individual pieces of genomic DNA, this this BQ strain, which is the one from the single site in Cameroon, it clustered with group O HIV in all the trees from the full length protein sequences, as opposed right. to before where it wasn't it was not th- that that was not the case in all three proteins, GAG pollen, G P forty one. Right. So the whole and so they say this suggests that this is a recombinant virus because if the individual proteins don't track with one virus then, and, and the full length does, then it must be a recombinant. So um, 
they looked at some of the other strains uh, from the BP site. Right, the BP had the multiple strains. BP two BP strains clustered with the P strains, the HIV P strains, and so that's very clear now from the full genome sequence. So as Rich suggested, now we have a conclusion more more solid. Uh, one of these sites has uh, SIV GORs that uh, track with the HIVP, and the other site, the BQ, where you have one isolate uh, with Group O. And that one isolate is is new, and this is really, without this, they wouldn't be able to nail it down to O, which is really right. interesting. They're very right. lucky to get that out of all these thousands of samples, right? Mm-hmm. And they, they go through the analysis of... Um, this BQ strain, they basically conclude, I don't think we need to go into all the analysis, it's a, re- it's a recombinant of multiple uh, pieces of, um, uh, of other viruses, but it's all related to group O, and that's why the original analysis didn't nail it down completely. Right. Which is not surprising. So um, three distinct clades of SIV gorilla. Uh, one, these viruses from... Uh, site what's called CP in southwest Cameroon. The second is from BP in western Cameroon, and the third from BQ in south central Cameroon. And um, so they say this is very clearly showing that uh, gorillas were the source of both HIV 1P uh, and O from gorillas to people. Yep. So, Dixon, is uh, do you have an issue with gorillas to people? Well, I mean, in. <sighs> No, because I think that's bushmeat yeah, transmission. But probably. I have a, a difficulty from chimpanzees to gorillas. Yeah, we'll get into that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> they actually talk. <laughs> so I, I, they they have people here who are gorilla experts, and they talk about that in the discussion. Okay. So the, that so these viruses went from <clears throat> from non um, from not from monkeys right into chimps, uh, and then into gorillas. And then from chimps to people and from gorillas to people. And they have a cool statement in here about how they can recognize that it came from chimps because of the organization of the genome. There's a couple of specific events uh, that uh, between the monkey and the, the, the virus that came into chimps was a recombinant as well from a couple of viruses yeah, in monkeys. Right. And that's, a sh- that's associated with a couple of uh, landmark uh, events, including one uh, one. Uh, anti-immune protein which uh, which is it it's um a vpu it's the acquisition of vpu and uh uh a an arrangement of the nef gene where it doesn't overlap the envelope gene and that, that that's yeah. that's uh signature events that this is uh from chimpanzees so when we when you and i talked to mike Araman, rich he was talking about that story remember? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah it's great stuff yeah so, so Dixon, are you okay from monkeys to chimps? Chimpanzees are killers. <laughs> they hunt monkeys and eat them. Okay, so you're no fine. problem there. That's bushmeat, but that's you know other people's bushmeat. All right. So now the the, conund- <laughs> the interesting conundrum is this gorilla virus. These viruses seem to have originated from a single transmission, right? From chimps, and as uh, Alan said before. That why is that only one? Chimps and gorillas are sympatric in this area. You'd think there'd be more. Mm-hmm. Why aren't there more transmission? So they say maybe. So they ask a why question. They do, don't they? Uh, did they actually say why? They didn't say it that way, but they <laughs> they <laughs> imply kind of you know they lead into it and they uh, what is it? Is this raised to the question of whether host restriction uh-huh. factors are limiting chimpanzee to gorilla transmission? That's okay, that's that's good because they actually have a hypothesis, right? Right, but it starts out as a why question, right? As you can tell. <laughs> uh, so one of the, the the particular restriction factor they look at is called ApoBec three G, which is a cellular protein that is incorporated into the virion, the virus particle in which will deaminate the viral genome and cause mutations and basically extinct it. And the virus has counteracting protein called VIF, both HIV and SIV, which will degrade ApoBec. The VIF does do the degradation in the same uh, cell where the ApoBec is. So it's the ApoBec getting packaged but if VIF can get to it before the ApoBec gets packaged, then you won't have the mutation of the HIV in the next round. Right. So they, they, 
ask whether um, gorilla uh, apoback it can be antagonized by chimpanzee SIV VIF. Right? They, they do a very nice cell culture experiment where they infect cells with virus lacking VIF, and then they introduce along with it VIF from different sources, from different viruses, and then apoback from either chimp or gorilla. And it's a wonderful experiment. They they vir- they measure virus production, and then by Western blot, they measure the degradation of uh, apobec by the introduced VIF. And the results are very clear. Only the gorilla VIF, only the gorilla VIF can counteract mm-hmm. SIV gorilla VIF can counteract gorilla apobec, right? And not chimpanzee VIF. Right. And that's in an infection, and if you look at the Western blot, only gorilla uh, VIF can, can degrade apobec. I found this very difficult to think about. I have a, a hard time with this because this is one of these multiple negatives, you know, <laughs> right. That's right. It's really difficult to think about. Right, but so bas- it means that if the chimpanzee virus comes into the gorilla, mm-hmm. normally the, the, the reason the virus can survive in the chimpanzee is because that virus can degrade the chimpanzee's apobec. Right. 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 That virus goes into the gorilla by mechanisms. We'll get to Dixon. Um, <laughs> I'm not get, terribly worried about this, by the okay, way. Okay. <laughs> gets, gets into the gorilla. Um, and that, the, the gorilla um, apobec is resistant to degradation. Right. So it can that, fight off by the that virus. By that virus's VIF. So it can fight off the virus just fine. Um However, if you take the SIV gore, its VIF um, is capable of degrading the gorilla apobec. That's why it's in gorillas, right? And that's why it's able to survive in the gorilla. So the the virus that can survive in the gorilla has the special ability of being able to degrade the gorilla apobec, which the chimpanzee virus can't do. Hmm. And that might explain why there's only been one infection from chimps to gorillas, because the chimp VIF isn't good at counteracting gorilla apobec. And in fact, the difference between the two is a single amino acid change, right? Oh, yes. And they do that experiment where they change the gorilla so that it resembles chimp, and now it can't uh, intact. Is that the way they do this experiment? Uh, That's the the gorilla. uh, That's a a mutation in the gorilla apobec, right? Yeah. Um... Okay, so replacing um, yes, right. So they they mu- sorry they mutate the gorilla, gorilla and it make it sensitive to all the chimp vif, right? right. And make it sensitive to the chimp vif. Yeah. But implied in this is that somewhere along the way in this spillover, the uh, the SIV vif must have changed. Yeah. Is that right? Am I thinking about this yes. right? So that it can now uh, uh, fight off the gorilla apobec. That's true. Right. They show that in fact the SIV yes. gorilla. VIF can certainly degrade um, apobec of gorillas, right? That's why they're infected. But for some reason, the others cannot. Well, because of this this one, they cannot overcome the, the apobec. Why the protein cannot, I don't think we know. They didn't really address why the VIF is unable to uh, hmm. degrade the gorilla. That's the next so, paper. Uh, are there other chimpanzee viruses that have jumped over into gorillas besides uh, SIV-1? Hmm, not that I know of. Why not? Uh, well, but I mean, sure. Dixon, they've got a lot of poo out there. <laughs> I know. Okay? There's they do. experiments for you to do. Uh, right. <laughs> they think Dixon is done. All right, they so, do, they do, they so I just sent you guys a figure by email that yes, helped me you. figure I'm this out. Now. So where, where is um, Apobec degraded? In the cell before it's put into the virus or after? It's... Apobec is degraded before, so I misunderstood what you were saying. Okay. So the VIF, yeah, before it gets put into the virus. But I was thinking you were talking about Apobec. That works which, afterwards, yeah. That works in the next yeah. cell, yeah. Okay. Sorry. All right, so that's 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 the results, which is really, really nice. So uh, Gorilla SIV, one crossover from chimps. Not as widespread as SIV is in, in chimps, by the way. Uh, and they also say something which I think is important to point out. Um this virus has infected gorillas for longer than HIV has infected humans. So before, you yeah. know, the early 1900s for sure. What does it do to the lifespan of the gorilla? Oh, that's think? a good question. 
they actually address this, whether it is actually... Because we don't know. We know in chimps that SIV certainly makes them sick. It kills them and has resulted in at least one chimp, known chimp uh, colony in Africa being wiped out. Hmm. You know, Jane Goodall's chimps were dying of uh, SIV hmm. infection, and, and Beatrice Hahn helped her figure that out. But we... As far as I can tell from the paper, they really don't know if, if it does anything to gorillas. They do know that gorilla numbers are going down, right? Right. And this could account for it. But we also know that other things like Ebola and other infections are... are, are and are, people. And people, and right. People. people are a huge problem for gorillas. Right. So right. They, they speculate it uh, could be habitat destruction. It could also be that the virus is pathogenic in the way that chimpanzee... SIV is pathogenic for chimpanzees, or it could be that the virus just hasn't spread enough yet. Right. Yeah. So but there was an Ebola epidemic in something like 2004. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that wiped out in some areas 90% of the gorillas. It really right. decimated. Uh, no. There's our word again decimated. <laughs> is 90% a decimation? Yes, that would be a decimation. <laughs> I think it is, yeah. Is that right, Dixon? No, it's just 10%. Ah, 10%. <laughs> 10%. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I'm still awake here. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but, in, but in common parlance, the word has yeah, yeah, evolved. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Words, right. words can they, evolve, yes. yes, yes. They can. Just yeah. like viruses. All right, so, Dixon. So they yes. point out, yeah. Go this, ahead, Alan. this bit about um, in the discussion, they point out that sharing the same habitat leads to direct and indirect contact contacts, which have resulted in the cross species transmission of other pathogens. Uh, and they cite references for anthrax, right. Ebola, and hepatitis B being transmitted between chimpanzees and okay. and gorillas. Okay. Oh, okay. So Dixon, they say such physical encounters, you know, involving biting or other contact have not been reported between chimps and gorillas, but right. they don't have to be very frequent to allow transmission, right? Mm. So, you know, people have never seen a, a, a gorilla and a chimp fighting, essentially. Yeah, listen, it took Jane Goodall 30 years to find out that chimpanzees eat meat. Mm. Right. That's a long time for observations without it, seeing it something It is hard that's, to observe these species. It yeah. is. It really is. Well, it's not and hard. Eight, it's and there ain't many gorillas left. Them. To hard observe. to observe them doing their natural behaviors. Yeah, right, right, right. And they Margaret Mead as as encountered that same thing with people. The other interesting issue here is uh, why this group O has only infected, right, 100,000 yeah. people or so. Yeah. That's what they yeah. estimate. And they go through some of the, um, some of the changes in the virus, and they, they end up concluding that it's not due to lack of adaptation, um, but it may be just a matter of opportunity. That's why I come back to those original observations with the M being amplified in yeah. that uh, in that uh, uh, area of yeah, right. uh, Brazzerville. Um, that O, you know, maybe it could have been O. It just happened to be M. Right. Yeah, they, they say that the two virus groups, M and O, probably paralleled in humans until about 50 years ago when we had the big expansion of AIDS. And then mm -hmm. M just took off and, yeah, you know... There's no genetic re basis to explain that at the moment, so maybe it's just opportunity. And, and human HIV doesn't jump back into gorillas, I presume. That's a good question. Can um, so the I, I don't think the glycoprotein will not permit that, right? That's why you have to make a shiv to. Well, that's for for non-human primates. I don't know about gorillas. For gorilla cells, right? Are there gorilla cell lines that you could do that experiment in? I'm sure someone knows. Know. Does HIV infect? Chimp or gorilla cells. Right. I know you're all screaming out there. Of course, of course not. <laughs> Don't worry. The guy who asked the question doesn't know anything about viruses, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> you know, you know about viruses, Dixon. I, I'm, I have a cursory level of knowledge of viruses. You're right. Well, and among Thanks other to you. things, the gorillas aren't going to eat the people. Right. Well, they're you not going to. They're not, not going to eat any meat. But you know what? They found Dixon, out recently. There's that, not much contact in that sense between right. humans and gorillas. So I don't know exactly. If what, I'm interested you know what? to know if, if the virus will replicate in those cells. You talk well, there's about, not much contact between humans and gorillas that the gorillas survive. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. That's what I meant. I yeah. read a recent yeah. report in the literature that, that white-tailed deer were caught eating squirrels. <laughs> Are you serious? Not wow. kidding. So that's awesome. A strict herbivore. They're going to have to rewrite. Badly. Probably doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so it, it doesn't really apply. I mean, I've seen a video of hippos attacking gazelle and eating them. Oh, so, hippos are nasty. They are, but they usually just kill you and leave you there. But th this right. time they they ate it. 
So a- anything else uh, we want to bring up before we leave this nice paper? It's a heroic amount of work. And she also reported on uh, Plasmodium falciparum looking yeah, at uh, right. droppings as well. So quite yeah. remarkable. Well, once you have droppings, you can do a lot of things with them. You do. Yes. And, and might I add that the purpose of droppings in the jungle, at least, is to foster the development of the fig. The what? Fig. Well, I didn't think they really had a purpose. <laughs> well, no, it's a, it's, fig, it actually has to pass through the gut tract of uh, primates in order to germinate. Oh. Okay. I'm going to go collect some forest poop and do some PCR. <laughs> All right, let's do some email. Uh, to do that, I would have to go back to the email then, wouldn't I? Well, where did do, you go? Do we need to do... Um, I was on the paper. Oh, sorry. So thank you, back. Alan. Yeah. We have something else. Uh, yeah, th- this episode is sponsored by uh, the book publishing arm of the American Society for Microbiology, which is known as ASM Press. And they would like to bring to your attention a new textbook called Principles of Microbial Diversity. This, this fills a gap in the microbiology textbook area by providing a up-to-date and pretty engaging view of microbial diversity. It's a textbook that you might use for upper-level undergrads, maybe microbiology majors, genetics, biology, uh, and it would allow your students to explore the, the huge range of biological diversity in the microbial world. It's written by Professor James Brown <laughs> and his band. Oh, no, different James <laughs> <laughs> I feel good. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I'm sure he feels good. He wrote his book. He's taught microbial diversity for over 20 years at North Carolina State University. And it gives a, a very nice survey of the tree of life wow. that helps you to understand the microbial world. So if you're looking for uh, such a textbook, or if you're just interested in microbial diversity, I meant to bring my copy in. I have one. Next time I'll bring it in and tell you about it. You can go over to asmscience.org and buy it. It's $90. So check that out. And we, of course, always appreciate the support of ASM for our podcasts. Yeah, they've been good to us. Yeah, mm-hmm. Dixon, do you need help in getting... I do, I do, I do. Give me your iPad. Um, while, while I'm helping Dixon... Struggling. Kathy Spindler, can you read that? Please. Sure. Ken Stedman writes, Dear TWIV team, Unfortunately, I am probably a little late for follow-up for TWIV 323. Great title, by the way. Uh, And the title, uh, that one was The Skid Loader Full of Viromes. There are a couple of things I wanted to follow up on for that paper that you discussed, and it was the Norman et al. 2015 paper. First, sorry to burst Rich's bubble, but the presence of pox viruses, uh, presence in quotes of quote, pox viruses, in their stool data set is almost definitely due to a match to the circovirus-like rep gene, which is found in canary pox virus and no other pox viruses, to my knowledge. We made the same mistake in the first analysis of our... Vincent, I need you to move your cursor. (laughs) It doesn't say that. You keep saying that, In the first analysis of our metagenome, from which the... They did it in the hot tub to have 195 <laughs> virus genome came. That brings me to my next point, which is how those data sets were generated. As is true for most metavirome studies, Norman et al. needed to amplify their DNA before sequencing. The amplification process, which they used, phi 29 DNA, polymerase-based multiple displacement amplification, generates lots of DNA but preferentially amplify circular single-strand DNA viruses like the circoviruses mentioned above and small double-strand DNA viruses with circular genomes, and he gives a reference for that. Norman et al. apparently used the same amplification protocol for all of their samples, so they should be comparable, but any assumptions regarding actual and possibly relative abundances must, must be made very carefully. Unfortunately, amplification, particularly of environmental samples, unless you have a skid loader full, is a necessary <laughs> evil. All amplification generates bias. It just needs to be acknowledged. That being said, I completely re- agree with your assessment of the paper, and I agree that we need a lot more data like this. I have a couple of picks of the week, if you haven't picked them. One is forest, one is forest roar, Melly, sorry, Mary <laughs> Yule, and Heather Mon, and now Hizakawa's Life in Our Phage World book. And he gives a link to the Amazon mm. 
uh, site for this book. It's also available online, and it gives another link. Um, there are also all of the talks from the meeting release party and a bunch of other cool stuff. If this, if I'm not mistaken, this is a book that you can actually just download for free. Mm-hmm. Um, high resin, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the second set of links. Okay. Um, the other thing that he includes, uh, and he says, is in parentheses hilarious in my opinion, spoof of "It's All About That Bass" from Lin Zakidrick's lab, and he sends this YouTube link. Full disclosure: I wrote a chapter in the book. I spoke at the meeting, and Lin is a friend from graduate school. <laughs> The temperature in Lincoln, Nebraska on February 27th, 2015, just in case it takes you a while to get to this email, <laughs> winky face, uh, this morning was minus six in Portland, Oregon when I got there, 56F. So Great. you started in Lincoln, ended up in Portland. Yep. Virocentrically <laughs> yours, Ken. Um, and the YouTube video is really good. It's very worth watching. I think I might show it, uh, you know, in the five minutes before class when the students are still coming in. Uh, it's all about the base. It's mm-hmm. good. I even went and watched the original <coughs> video all about oh, the base because yeah. I wasn't familiar with it. I meant to. And I liked them both. Uh-huh. So this is interesting because, um, you know, uh, com- um, in- what's the word I'm looking for? Bioinformatic analysis of sequences is a different game from what most people have done and you have to there are different issues you know and this is one of them mm-hmm. you know box the rep gene who knew that right did you know that rich condit <laughs> no yeah there you good go. may know and i didn't know that this 529 selectively amplified these guys either mm-hmm. so this is good to know thank you ken all right rich condit can you take the next one john writes dear twivers in episode 321, the discussion of experiments having hyperpathogenic potential was interesting, but I think it misses a larger and far more significant point. I'm not so worried about the activities of a few responsible leading-edge virologists today, but I am greatly worried what happens when, 20 years from now, biotechnology has advanced to the point that any intelligent high school student can create hypertransmissible or hyperpathogenic organisms. We can't rule this out. 40 years ago, humans could not splice DNA. 20 years ago, sequencing a genome took uh, national-scale resources, but today it costs less than an iPad at full retail. (laughs) What will off-the-shelf kits allow in 20 years? Given biotechnology's current trajectory, the genie is already effectively out of the bottle, so we must act now because, as your colleagues in the world of computer viruses have painfully learned, betting the fate of uh, civilization on the sound mental health and law-abiding nature of teenagers is unwise. RNA hacking will become the new computer hacking. That's why this is a golden opportunity for virology. If 20 years from now it's straightforward to engineer a terrible offensive virus from the chemical elements found in a handful of dirt, there is really only one possible response. The defensive side of virology has to be as good as or better as the offensive side. So if I were a virologist, I would call for a massive increase in research funding (laughs) in the name of Homeland Security. Uh but it would really be species security. As a specific goal, I'd suggest the world's industrial nations aim to develop within 10 years the ability to detect, characterize, and counter on a national scale any new viral or bacterial threat within 30 days of its appearance. This will be hard, enormously, insanely hard, and far more complex and challenging than either the Manhattan Project or the Apollo program. Mm -hmm. It may be argued that the threat is speculative and doesn't merit a response of this magnitude, but I would say that the threat is uh, when, not if. And even if the threat never develops, the benefits of the program would be immense and would accrue as the project progresses, not just at completion. Virology today strikes me as a cottage industry of a couple of thousand people. Given the materializing threats, it cannot remain so. Virologists may find it distasteful to support the state's goals so openly, but they are worthy goals. Importantly, I'm not saying academic freedom should be curtailed, just the opposite. Let's do all the experiments, and let's, but let's do them in plentiful BSL-4 labs if necessary with well-trained plentiful personnel. Increased funding will enable far 
greater academic exploration center possible now. Example, NASA had freedom to fund development of nuclear rockets in 1960s, but could never do so now. This proposal does not solve the problem of what knowledge to keep secret and what knowledge to spread, but I believe it identifies the bigger problem wrapped around the gain-of-function controversy. I'll look forward to your thoughts. Thank you, John. Um, uh, let me do is optional before yes. we address this. Optional, I don't want this letter to be too long, but I've listened to enough TWIV to know that Alan is skeptical of the potential for engineered or weaponized microorganisms to cause havoc. This is puzzling to me because the responses are so numerous. Uh, if indeed, therefore, I'd offer that. First, natural organisms uh, seem to do a great job of causing havoc, and they're not even trying. In fact, evolution tamps down their virulence. Second, there is the precedent of the 1979 Sverdlovsk accident that killed 100 Soviets downwind from a bioweapons plant, again without trying. Third, there is the precedent of the 1977 Russian flu which circled the world after escaping from a laboratory freezer somewhere. That one is personal because it infected me quite unpleasantly, I might add, and we don't know if someone was trying or not. And fourth, even if all the above points are rejected, <laughs> saying that enhanced bioweapons are improbable because smart people couldn't develop them in the 80s is like saying that airplanes are improbable because Leonardo da Vinci failed to build one. He could do it today alone just using a kit. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Go for it, Alan. Jetpacks. Intergalactic travel, <laughs> flying cars. We've been promised all of these things in science fiction for decades. None of them have happened. And it's not because smart people can't figure it out. It's because if you actually think about the physics behind what would be involved in getting them to not just work, but actually be practical, you quickly realize that they are just not going to happen. You cannot carry enough fuel in a person-sized device to fly your non-aerodynamic body any distance that would be worth the effort. It's just not going to happen. Um, so to say that I, I, my argument is not that smart people haven't been able to develop bioweapons you know, up to today, therefore it'll never happen. My My central argument on this is the whole concept of bioweapons is flawed. Nature has been developing bioweapons for three and a half billion years plus. They're as good as they're going to get. And those are the naturally circulating pathogens. We evolved in that environment. The reason something like a nuclear weapon or a chemical weapon is so much deadlier than any biological weapon that's ever been developed is because we did not evolve in an environment of temperatures suddenly rocketing to several thousand degrees Celsius or of artificial compounds that can uh, simultaneously seize all of our neurons. Those things never existed in our evolutionary history. So we're completely unprepared for them. So those weapons can be very effective. Biological weapons are bound by the same biology we came from and are therefore bound by exactly the same constraints that bind natural pathogens. Uh, the Sverdlovsk incident, um, I would not say that was without trying. That was actually a professional-grade bioweapon that was developed specifically to kill people um, and was developed by one of the world's superpowers at the time by, uh, that had unlimited funding and hundreds of very smart scientists at their disposal, and it was released as an aerosol over a major city, and it killed 100 or so people. What was the pathogen? Um, the pathogen was anthrax. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, it's tra it's certainly tragic for, and we don't actually have an accurate count. The the of course the Soviets suppressed that information um, aggressively, but just given the population of the city and and what is known to have happened, we're talking hundreds of deaths, not millions, um, certainly. And if that had been even a minor nuclear accident in the same location there wouldn't be a Sverdlovsk. So biological weapons have been a non-starter throughout their whole history because they are running up against fundamental laws of nature that we're not going to get around. 
Um, the 1977 Russian flu is an interesting case. We, we are not certain that that came from a laboratory freezer. There's some very, some very suggestive evidence that it, it may very well have. Um, you know, the emergence of it and the fact that it had not drifted at all from a previous strain um, and the, the populations that were most affected by it. On the other hand, it was not particularly worse than any ordinary flu year. So the 77 Russian flu was uh, was a much milder thing than, say, the 1957 pandemic. Um, so again, coming back to this fundamental idea that nature's already explored all these options, I'm not especially worried about however the technology develops. Um, a smart teenager 20 years from now tinkering around with this stuff is going to run up against exactly the same limitations that the Soviet scientists in the 80s had. I also want to add that uh, our government is trying to be prepared for this sort of situation. They're, they're spending a lot of money on you know, preparedness and early detection. And I, I spoke recently with three people in the U.S. government that are involved in this. And you should go listen to TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, number 99. <clears throat> One of them is an FBI agent, and two of them are working for the Department of Health and Human Services, and they're all about, and we talked about garage biology and the threat that it poses, and they're all about being ready. So I think we are putting money in, and the problem I have, John, is if we put more, it's going to come away from basic research, and I don't want that to happen. I think it should come out of the defense budget. Good luck with that. I know. <laughs> I know. Anyway. Yeah. All right. Any other comments? No, I, I think that covers it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, John, for the nice yes, long thank letter you and good thoughts. Yeah, we appreciate thoughts. it. We appreciate it. Yeah. Um, Johnny sent us a video, uh, our friend in Cambridge, our pediatrician. It's a message for the anti-vaccine movement, and it's an autoplay, I think, right? So I'm not going to look at it right now. Yeah. Any, uh, I, 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 this was Johnny stole my pick. <laughs> really? I had, yeah, I had queued this up as a pick. This is a riot. Have you guys looked at this? This is really good. Yeah, this is actually quite important. This is Jimmy, Jimmy uh, Kimmel, Kimmel, uh, yes. uh, going off on the anti-vaccine movement. All right, and uh, it's from his show, and he has a terrific, just really abrasive monologue for the anti-vax guys. It's funny, and then he has a public service announcement that he put together of doctors. Uh, 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 trashing the anti-vax movement, and it starts out like any public service announcement, and then the doctors st start getting pretty rude. All right, <laughs> and it's 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 a riot. And there's a follow-up to this actually, because he uh, got a, a whole slug of tweets afterwards from a bunch of nut jobs that he read on his uh, uh, show subsequently that are just insane it's incredible <laughs> how worked up some people get about this it's it it's amazing i can and, and it, we could do, you know we could do that we we get some of this stuff we don't read we could read them and show people yeah. how ridiculous it is right sure. yeah. was one of them from ben stein no you don't get At that any reference because jimmy kimmel used to be on a show with ben stein and ben stein is a known creationist so i think that uh, uh, no. So this uh, th this video is well worth watching. Right. It's very mm -hmm. good. Uh, Dixon, can you read the next one? I sure can. Yegor. Yegor. <clears throat> Dear Twiv, a couple of small notes regarding the last episode. First, the now famous quote about vaccine-preventable disease tracking with whole foods <laughs> locations. Is this just a stereotype, or do you know of any data that would actually support it? I tried to reach to search online, but instead found this article, and he quotes uh, an article. Uh, which links to a research paper showing that anti-vaccine beliefs are spread fairly equally across the ideological spectrum in the U.S. Secondly, you had an intense discussion about the career implications of getting a Ph.D. and doing a postdoc. Why not invite some people to do TWIV who are virologists but are not working in academia? You can invite someone from a pharma company, a biotech, CDC, FDA, funding agencies that editors from Nature, etc., and ask them whether these things were important for their careers and what is more relevant to current job market, what they are looking for when they are hiring. Regards, Igor. Does anyone know about the Whole Foods thing? No, I don't. That's something um, 
uh, Seth Manukin said um, it, it, it is a kind of a common perception, and if you map a lot of the um, uh, the poor vaccination rates in areas, you do find that it tracks with affluent, often liberal communities. Um, I know that that work. Some of that work was actually done um, <clears throat> by um, Trina Sedaris uh, when mm -hmm. she was at the Chicago Tribune. Uh, she and a couple of other folks there at the Trib put together this amazing infographic of districts in Chicago that had the lowest um, vaccination rates in their schools. And there were two groups. They were the very poorest schools, mm -hmm. and there were low vaccination rates because the right. you know the family situations and the parents just couldn't get the kids to the doctor. Right. Um, and some of the very wealthiest districts in you know that mm -hmm. was that was the Jenny McCarthy crowd. Mm -hmm. Um, but this link is actually really interesting, um, mm -hmm. which, which does, it talks about a study where they, they mapped various anti-science and, and other issues, um, to conservative versus liberal viewpoints. Um, uh, and some stuff does track as you'd expect it to global warming denialism is, is very prominent <laughs> among conservatives and not very prominent among liberals. But the childhood vaccines line is more or less flat. All right, I just sent an email to Trina. Strange bedfellows. It was we'll see what she has to say. Yeah. What's um, Trina doing now? Is she still in business for herself? She works for a consulting, a communications company in Chicago. Yeah, she does okay. PR. Yeah, PR stuff. She, she left the uh, Tribune. Uh, and the other suggestion, sure, we'll we'll get all different people on. I think we do, and we That'd often ask show, them. Actually. We often yeah. ask them, but we yeah. could do that. Sure. Um, I'm gonna you have a you have a co-host who's from a background like that too. <laughs> <laughs> Just <Yeah>. saying. <laughs> yeah, we know your position. <laughs> you know, someone on Twitter accused me of wanting to maintain the status quo. And really? John Skylar, really? in terms of postdocs, John Skylar came to my defense. But, you know, I'm not trying to maintain the status quo. I have reasons for not wanting to just abandon it, all right? So this is the problem with Twitter is that, you know, you don't get a lot of time to explain yourself. It's not about that at all. But John and Alan agreed that it was so not about that. It might that. also right. be useful to search around the uh, developed world for the most robust <laughs> science programs and see how they run because, uh, you know, when countries spend more than 2% of their gross national product on research, uh, that allows for a lot of money and stuff like this. So uh, perhaps yeah. different models do exist out there that we're just not aware of. All right, uh, we'll work on a show and get all that together. Let's do two more. I'm going to read uh, Ani's. Thank you for the sample chapter of the textbook you are writing. I found it much more readable than the hateful texts mentioned in my original email. I like the straightforward style of delivery as opposed to the obfuscation employed in the wording of many texts. I took about three days to read it in order to do so slowly and make sure I followed the ideas presented. At first, it was a bit overwhelming, mind-blown here. The illustrations helped, too. I plowed through, and I can say I have a much better understanding of how different viruses are ushered into healthy cells, often by way of using many of the same functions used by normal cell life. Fascinating. Just please do not give me the final exam today. <laughs> <laughs> I sent Ani a, a chapter on virus entry. As well as the final exam. Yeah. It is currently 34 degrees in Chattanooga, clear with wind six miles per hour from the southeast. Thanks again for the honor. All right, and that brings us to Alan. I've saved this one for you, Alan. Yes. John writes, Dear anti-anti-vaxxers, it is minus 10 C, headed for minus 20 in the suburbs of Boston. Uh, yeah, I get that. <laughs> I have a virus, the kind that makes you sick, and a man in my neighborhood is wielding a strange machine that looks like a 19th century snowblower. See attachment. That, John, is a wobble. <laughs> uh, you know, I never would have known it were it not for Twib. I looked at the picture and I said, it's a wobble. It's a wobble. <laughs> yep. and, and because he's wearing overall style snow pants, he does look like he's from the 19th century. <laughs> he looks very Amish. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Ha. And, the, and the style, I, I think they changed the wheel design a little bit, but that style with the sort of curly yeah. uh, wheel design, it looks like it's off something from the 1800s. That yeah. is true. All right. Uh, continue with John's letter on <laughs> that, Twiv. That might actually be an episode uh, picture. Yes. <laughs> yeah, sure we can do that. 
On 324, you read a letter about vaccination of premature infants. Your response emphasized the safety of vaccines given on the normal schedule. The literature review you cited did say vaccination was safe, but did not unequivocally say that vaccination was effective. According to that paper, vaccination of premature infants protects against diphtheria, tetanus, and polio. It is less effective against pertussis, hepatitis B, and flu, and a booster dose may be required. Explaining this to a worried parent of a premature infant, it should take less than 10 seconds. Vaccines are still safe, but we might need to give her an extra booster dose next year. Uh Vincent's Pick of the Week was an article lamenting the unwillingness of regulators to discipline anti-vaccination doctors. I think doctors who cannot explain why a premature baby should be vaccinated on schedule should not be caring for those babies. All right. Yep. I think we had a similar sentiment last week from Johnny. Mm -hmm. You should check out Johnny's uh, very nice document Mm -hmm. on this as well. All right. Let us do some picks of the week. I'm going to put you on the spot, Dixon. No, you're not. You don't have a pick, do you? I do so. (laughs) (laughs) What do you have? I have the book that I haven't read yet, but I gave it to you as I picked. <laughs> You're picking it's, a book you haven't read yet. I am, but I read the review of the book in science. Oh, man. It's called The Philosophy of Microbiology or The Philosophy of Bacteria. I think you have the uh, the blurb that I brought in, Vincent. It's Where? someplace on your desk. I can't find it right now, but you can find it. It's in the latest issue of uh, Science. And the review was uh, very, very laudatory and extremely... Uh, I wouldn't say kind because uh, you don't write reviews to be kind. You write them to be informative. But the book, I've never seen a book written about the philosophy of a group of organisms before. So I thought it would be a fascinating pick no matter whether it's a... Philosophy of microbiology. That's the one. That is the one. Maureen O'Malley. You got it. Yeah, you got it. You got it. Did you read the review, Alan? Uh, No, I did not. I haven't. Ah, because it's a very favorable review. And it says, you know, how can there be a... Philosophy of a group of organisms. I was fascinated just by the title. So, having a PhD, the PH part of it spoke to me on that one. So that's my pick. Uh, you know, you can pick whatever you want, Dixon. But it's pretty weird picking a book. Uh, I can you pick my read. friends, and I can pick my nose, but I can't pick my friend's nose. <laughs> All right, Alan, what do you have? I have. Um a link to a bill that has been introduced in the California legislature. Um, So any of our listeners in California, you can look this up. It is uh, SB277. This is a bill that would remove California's or would would change California's um, uh, law on vaccination for kids being admitted to public schools and daycare centers and such. Currently, that law allows uh, an exemption for medical reasons or personal beliefs. And this bill eliminates the exemption for personal beliefs. Right. Is it going to pass? Because you are entitled to your own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. That's right. Yep. Is this uh, going to pass? Is it going to pass? I don't know. I am trying to give it the twiv bump here. So <laughs> any, any of our listeners who are in California, please look up who your state representatives are and um, please pester them. This should make for a very interesting debate. Yes. In California. Oh. Yes. It, it particularly, Yes. Yeah, this is also mentioned in an email we didn't get to uh, from Johnny, uh, because ah. I, I already knew about it, uh, the the bill. Mm. I th- I'm pretty sure. Somebody tweeted it to yes. me. So. As measles cases spread, state legislatures respond. Yes. Ah, okay. And it's not the only thing either. I think that the whooping cough is on the rise as well, so mm-hmm. that's terrible. It's all terrible news, basically. So, Great. That's good. Oh, yeah. We can watch that. Keep a keep a, your uh, finger on the pulse of that one, Alan. Yes, I'll <laughs> see what I can do. Rich, what do you have for us? Um, this is uh, sort of dated, but it was new to new to me. Uh, the Kepler Space Observatory. Oh, yeah. I came across this because of something I saw on Facebook about uh, Kepler 186F, which is uh, a planet that was discovered. Yeah by this space observatory that is uh, orbiting a dwarf star about, I think, 500 light years from here that is in what's called the habitable zone. That is, it's close enough in Earth-like characteristics so that it could theoretically uh, harbor Earth-like life. So that got me into looking up the Kepler Space Observatory, and I think what I have here is just a wiki link to it, uh, which I, you know, I sort of was vaguely aware of, but it's really interesting. This is 
a, a kind of sort of space telescope uh, that was launched in uh, 2009 for the specific purpose yes. of trying to find Earth-like planets. And all it does is take light readings off of stars right. in a certain portion of our own Milky Way galaxy, and it looks for fluctuations in the intensity of the emissions, the light emitting from those stars, uh, that would be consistent with planets crossing in front of the stars. Hmm. Right. And yes. uh, it has discovered... Uh, numerous planets Thousands. that fall into this category right. of the uh, habitable uh, oh, zone. And I think the projections are that our galaxy probably contains on the order of somewhere between 40 and 100 billion habitable planets. Right. <laughs> Carl said, this, Dan, are you listening? <laughs> uh, this yeah. thing uh, was originally launched with a uh, projected three-year lifetime, but is, as, yeah. it, as is not untypical in these, that was extended to uh, at least four years or something. It ran into some problems. Yes. They had to sort of, um, uh, uh, because of some uh, issues that arose four years after it launched, they had to sort of reconfigure its mission to squeeze more data out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's still yielding data because this yeah, Kepler-186 came up in uh, about a year ago. At any rate, I thought it was interesting. This, this is cool. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and this whole this whole Kepler story is, um, uh, reminds me of the intro to a video game I played through with my daughter about a year ago called Pikmin 3. Mm -hmm. um, and civilization searches for other planets and, and then mm -hmm. goes and explores them because they've, they've kind of run out the resources on their home planet. Um, mm, I sounds like a movie plot. It's, it is, it's an amazing game. If anybody who's listening who has a Wii U, I strongly recommend Pikmin 3. It's really stunning. I have to say that one of the things that uh, always bothers me about this notion of searching for life elsewhere is that the fundamental assumption is that it's going to be a carbon-based life form that you know yeah. lives in an environment similar to ours, and I think that that's nuts. You know, mm -hmm. I think that there can be you know, I mean, I, I would imagine there could be things that we would call living evolving in environments that are much much different than ours. So no kill I yeah. So, if you didn't have a carbon-based, you, you're thinking there might be elements we don't even know about? Silicon. Well, silicon, silicon would work, silicon, probably. Yeah. yeah? That's it. That was a Star Trek um, yeah. reference. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Hey, Rich, you like space? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, listen, I just, I, I was tempted to pick... I'm still make, working my way through Star Trek Next Generation. <laughs> and last week, I watched one of my favorite episodes. It's episode 12 of season 6. It's called Ship in a Bottle. And it's just wonderful. It's, it's, uh, it's one of these, uh, one of the Star Trek themes is hol holodeck malfunction. Okay? <laughs> and this is uh, uh, holodeck malfunction uh, supreme. If anybody watches this, just look closely for the punchline in the denouement. It's just absolutely terrific. I'm not going to give it away. Yeah, it's so great. We, we just lost a Star Trek star, didn't we? Leonard Nimoy died. Yeah, we, talked, yep. we, we, did that, we did that. We did that. We eulogized him last week. That's, okay, that's sorry, right, I wasn't Dixon. there. You weren't here. Dixon. No, I was not. I was you not. Were. I was away. Rich, you want to take the one-way trip to Mars? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. Why not? <laughs> I've, I, you know, I don't know if I got enough time left. How yeah, long? you got kids. You got, got grandkids. You don't want to go to Mars. Yeah. They'd miss you. Think so? Yeah, of course. Yeah, we could take the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We can make a little colony. Yeah, what was that Swiss? What was that space thing with the family out there, right? Yeah. Lost in space. Lost in space, Lost in right. Space. Mm -hmm. Danger Will Robinson. That's right. Danger Will Robinson. Hey, Kathy, what, what do you have? Um, I have a follow-up because Ken Stedman wrote to me. He had wanted to listen to the Mary Claire King uh, live at the Moth, and th he said the link didn't work, but uh, it was several days before I could get to it, and the link now works, and it takes you directly to her 15-minute Moth story. So okay. that was from Twiv322, Who Can You Trust? And mm -hmm. I've sent it to several people, and um, uh, my, one of my brothers, for example, and said, you really have to listen to this, and he <laughs> said, oh, okay, okay. And then he wrote back and said, this is a really great story. So, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, so that's the follow up. And what I've picked for today is something uh, kind of similar to what we've had before. Uh, this is a USGS 
uh, HHS CDC disease map. Oh, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Phil, sent it. And it's for West Nile, uh, St. Louis encephalitis virus, yeah. uh, Weave, Eve, Lacrosse, Powassan, the and Dengue virus. And then you can yeah, uh, look on, uh, you know, what's uh, for the dengue, for what's endemic and what's been imported and clicked mm-hmm. by state and so mm-hmm. forth. So I think we've had maps like this before, but it's always fun to find new ones. That's pretty true. cool. Yeah, Even yeah. if they did misspell Massachusetts. Oh, well. Did they? In the pull down, oh. on the map it's correct. On the pull down <laughs> menu, it's not. Oh dear, uh, that's ridiculous. Trust it's too bad. <clears throat> oh, well, that Alan would notice, right? Yes, I of course, being the provincialist that I am, I, I went right to my home state, <laughs> uh, current home state. <laughs> did I get everyone except myself? Yes, I think I did. Right. I think and so. what did you pick? Oh, I picked a. Um, a science, an online science site called Nautilus, hmm. which we've never picked before, and, and I think is really cool. So this is a site um, where scientists write articles, and they they do a monthly thing where it's in four parts, and they release a part every Thursday. And the web design is absolutely tremendous. Awesome. Yeah, it is really very different. And um, this, you know, you may not always like the stories. It's different aspects of science, including social science and math and so forth. But I, I kind of like it. It's interesting, and, and it's not always what I do, you know. So mm-hmm. it's good. The writing is by scientists, and mm-hmm. um, you know, it's quite interesting. Interesting topics. This week we have um, issue number twenty-two. So we have. Um, um, relationships casual sex may be improving america's marriages we have psychology why your brain hates slow pokes chemistry how to turn your dog off and music how music hijacks our perception of time what is the map on the uh lower left it's a u.s map is that a drought monitor map wild winter who done it climate ah. change over the u.s with a slow jet stream Okay. So they also have a blog, and those are its blog posts. But the, right. the actual magazine is quite well done, so check it out. Okay? That's Nautilus, which is very cleverly N-A-U-T-I-L dot U-S. Gee, <laughs> Dixon, did you know you could have dot U-S as a domain? I had no idea. Wow. It's sort of like... That stands TV. for Upper Scandinavia. <laughs> this is really well done. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's a very, very nice publication. We have a couple of picks of the week. We have a pick from Neil, who writes, Dear Vincent and Twiv co-hosts, given your recent focus on Ebola, I thought you would enjoy viewing the webcast of a special presentation giving at the recent Croy in Seattle by Gilles Van Kutzem of MSF. He's received a standing ovation from the audience. Please share with the Twiv audience. Mm. The link to that. So I, uh, uh, Croy, by the way, is a conference on retroviruses and opportunistic infections. And this is from just a week ago, or no, a couple of weeks ago, February, end of February in 2015. And I listened to this whole lecture, and it's outstanding. I would highly recommend it. And I'm going to take this uh, as an opportunity to interject a very brief Ebola sit rep because we're up from 99 last week to 135 new cases this week. And one of the points that this speaker makes is that there were opportunities early on in the Ebola epidemic to step in and crush it, Uh, and those opportunities were missed. Uh, And although we've been pretty casual in describing uh, the end of this as uh, whack-a-mole, it's not over yet. And, um, And... they, so uh, ex, uh, international vigilance is still uh, uh, really important. Mm-hmm. And I have to say that I'm just so impressed with these Doctors Without Borders and everybody else who works on this. It's just amazing. So I would recommend this lecture. It's yep. very good. And yes, yeah. there's, been, there's been an uptick. There's good news and bad news. The bad news is that um, it's coming back in some areas. Uh, the good news is that the last known Ebola patient in Liberia was just released from hospital. Cool. But then there's uh, always Lhasa, and that's just come up. Hasn't oh, right. It? So the, uh, I mean, Rich's point about the continued vigilance, um, I, I am hopeful, but also cynically kind of think that this won't happen. That this will maybe draw attention to the need for ongoing support for public health, mm-hmm. you know, 
Mm-hmm. Network, That's one of his works in in these countries, which mm-hmm. is the reason you have this problem in the first place. And sure. we can prevent this. There is no reason this needs to happen in the 21st century. That's right. And I mean, we collectively, humanity, not uh, yeah, not yeah, a particular. Yeah, yeah. Group. yeah this speaker uh, uh, makes it clear that he's um, disappointed, to say the least, in the you know the international response to the Ebola crisis and it, attention in the long term to public health in these sort of areas in general. And this is this goes back decades. Yes. Sure. Uh, our other pick is from Ricardo. Hello, Twiv friends. Thank you very much for your hard work. I do feel it is hard work, but fun. Today I'm sending a pick that I do think is a great idea. Beekeeping just got a turning point. And this is for a Indiegogo you know, campaign. You support them. Um, for, a pro- for an item called Flow Hive. It's a beehive, and it's got um, a tube coming out of it, and you can turn the faucet and get... get um, Honey out of it. So you can this buy the, is amazing. You can buy That's the whole cute. thing for six hundred bucks, or you could support them. Different and it's good, yeah, it's good because it doesn't disrupt the bees, yeah. so they're happier. Yeah, it's pretty funny. It's a continuous flow beehive. Takes all the work out of hard harvesting. You got this young lady turning the tap, and the jars are filling with honey. It's a beemostat. Uh, I'm going to have to look at this video. I'm hoping it shows how it works. Honey, I shrank the hive. <laughs> Good. My best regards. P.S. For the first time, I'm giving extra credits for Twix listening and info integration into a semester work for my nursing students. Nice. Very good. Ricardo is our buddy in Portugal. And nice. that will do it for three of th- TWIV 327, which used to be the number of an airplane made by Boeing. The 327 with the three engines on the back. Mm-hmm. Interesting uh-huh. aircraft, but very noisy and now being phased out. I don't know what why that's relevant, but it is, and you can find three two seven, not at the airport, but at iTunes twiv TV, and all the all the episodes are there. They're they're yours to listen to as long as you want for free. And if you have questions and comments, please send them to twiv at twiv TV. And I would like to thank the wonderful participants in this episode, Dixon De Palmier. Thank you so much. Had a great time. Verticalfarm dot com, urbanag dot ws. Yep. We just released an Urban Ag last week. We did. It was fun. Yeah. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan, which is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure thing. Always a good time. Keep on trekking. You know, Rich, I, uh, I listen to some podcasts that have... One of the sponsors is this company that will print your pictures on glass... And it's located in Gainesville, Florida. No kidding. And these guys are always like, here at this company, they take your picture in Gainesville and make sure it looks beautiful on glass. And every time they say that, I think Rich Condit has got it. <laughs> I, I, I need a link to this. i got to go visit these guys. Go yeah. make a glass of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, they make different sizes, and you just you hang them up. Apparently, everyone's going nuts over this. I don't know why. Anyway, it's in Gainesville. And uh, Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. You can also find Alan on the Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.